Good morning, St. Mark. We do have a very special Sunday today. Uh, it's Memorial Day weekend. Also, in, in the church, um, in the Christian faith, we take today and we mark it out and we call it Pentecost. And this is the Sunday when we remember and we involve ourselves in the story of how Jesus promised to send us the life of the Spirit. And today you're going to see that, that theme running through our entire service as we're thinking about the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. We're embracing it and we're moving into it even more day by day by his power. And so it's Pentecost and we're going to celebrate that today. And we're going to do it today by singing a hymn that's appropriate for Pentecost. It's our opening hymn. You can find it right there in your bulletins. It's called Come Holy Ghost God and Lord, a prayer for the Holy Spirit. Please stand as we begin our Pentecost worship. We begin with prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And you shall renew the face of the earth. Holy Spirit, cleanse us and make us new. Give us self-control. Forgive us from slavery to our impulses, lusts, and greed. 
Make us gentle. Make us faithful like Christ. Give us hearts that see value in the fighting, keeping promises, and being a loyal presence. Fill us with goodness. Pour out your kindness through us. Destroy in us unloving criticism, unfair thinking, and hearts that do not go out to our neighbor. Make us patient. Eliminate our short tempers, our quick irritation, and our every annoyance. Give us peace. Eradicate our anxiety and fear. Grant us joy. Give us love. Forgive us, Holy Spirit, for our lack of love. Forgive us for every grief we have caused you and every moment we have failed to walk with you and your gifts to us. Forgive us, renew us, and forgive us. Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. In Christ's stead and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the, and the Father, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. It's Pentecost Sunday, a very, very big festival in the church, and our first lesson retells us the story to involve us in it. This is the reading, the lesson from Acts chapter 2, the sending of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now. They were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. 
When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. Please stand our respect for the words and the works of Jesus. Our gospel for today comes from John chapter 7. And here Jesus promises to give us the life of the Spirit. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Our sermon hymn um, is a classic Christian hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. Uh, please join singing it together.
Here's the scripture that we're going to look at. It's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we have three verses here from the Apostle Paul. He says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Short and sweet. How's that? Short and sweet. It is short. <laughs> two of the verses here are two words long. You get an invitation along with an adverb. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Boom. Bada boom. <laughs> That's it. Short and sweet. It's short, sweet too, really sweet. You know, we're picking this up. We're, pi we're picking this up together today on Pentecost, the sending of the Holy Spirit, because it's so sweet for your life. You know what? I really, really want to show you. I want to. I want to this is what I want to do with you today. Is I want to. I want to do something more than just celebrate. Although, although I do want to celebrate. Today is a day when we celebrate the new life of the Spirit that has been planted inside of you. You have it. You have it. Christians have it. Every Christian, you have the life of the Spirit inside of you, and I want to celebrate that with you, that you have it, a supernatural life, the life of God. And what this verse, what this verse helps you to do is it helps you recognize it. And when you see, when you recognize it, you not only get to celebrate, wow, that's God's life in me, God's own life, this supernatural life, this incredible life celestial life, you get to recognize it and you get to move into it even more. That's what you get to do. You recognize it, you move in, you start walking with the Holy Spirit in your life even more. And it's short and sweet and this is going to help you do it. It's a, it's a punch list. It's bullet points from Paul. And the first one is this, that you rejoice Always. You recognize that the first word is natural. Everybody rejoices. There's people all over the country right now who are rejoicing. Why? Because <laughs> they get to work off tomorrow. It's normal. It's nat Your team wins in sports. You're, you rejoice. You're happy. Everybody rejoices. Rejoicing is such a, a natural thing that we call it a mood disorder when you can't naturally rejoice. We think you've got to get help. We think maybe you should get medication. You should see somebody. Rejoicing's natural. Here's what it is, and I want to help you think about this. There's a, there was a, a columnist who asked his readers, how they're doing in life, he got 5,000 replies. He said it was absolutely overwhelming. He got 5,000 replies, and this is how he summed up the replies. He said, he asked him, how are you doing in life? And this is what many people said. He summed it up this way. He said, many people are hanging in there these days, but he said this, there is a river of woe running through our country. A significant portion of our friends and neighbors are in emotional agony. That's what he said. So it's natural to rejoice. Everybody has times of rejoicing. Here's what's different. Always. <laughs> That's special. Always. You see what Paul is doing is he's putting, he's putting this on the timeline of your life, always, all the time. Every dot on the line of your life is an opportunity for you to rejoice. It's not just sometimes, it's always. That's the supernatural life of the Spirit, always. Sometimes, sometimes I get worried, like when you hear that kind of stuff, rejoice always, and rejoice always, what's happening is people start thinking that Christians are like somebody in a cartoon, and picture a cartoon, you got these crazy Christians in this car, and they've got 
you know, the hood back and the, and the hair and, their, and the wind on their heads in their hair if they've got some. And it's a cartoon of all these Christians who are flying into a concrete wall and they just don't care. Rejoice always. <laughs> and it's like that. And this, that's not it. That's not it. We're trying to nuance this right now. That's not it. We're not rejoicing always because we're going to stick our heads in the sand. We don't realize we're, falling. we're flying right into a concrete wall, wall, that there's something coming that's going to hurt us. We don't, it's not it. It's something, something different. The Apostle Paul, right here in this letter, he's concerned. He's very, very concerned in parts of this letter for the personal safety of the Thessalonians. It is not that we are flying in a concrete wall and we don't care. So then what is it? Why can we rejoice all the time? Every dot on the line. Always. Why? Well, I, part of me feels like the poet. The poet who says, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Because there's a lot of different ways I could go at this. But I think, I think if I summed it up, I could, I could sum up the answer to this question. How do, how, do, how do we rejoice in sadness? How do we rejoice when it looks like we're running into a concrete wall? How do we do this? I could do it like this. We realize that all of us as Christians are going to transcend all of our circumstances. Because in all of our circumstances, God is still in heaven. So we realize we're going we're to transcend this thing. So that in whatever is going on in our life, we realize God is over all of it. And so we rejoice. And so I made a list. I made it ready for my list. Here's my list. I made a list. We can rejoice in God, in His ways, in His heart, in His power, in His glory, in His love, in His governance, in His care in his plan, in his faithfulness, somebody getting touched in here is something for your life, in his goodness, in his righteousness, in his attention, in his compassion, in his saving, in his help, in his awesomeness, in his justice, in his strength, in his life, in his eternity, in his favor, in his protection, in his angels, in his deeds, in his thoughts, in his majesty, in his holiness, in his avenging, avenging in his creative ability, in his knowledge, in his, you think I'm done yet? I'm not done yet. In his greatness, in his kingdom, in his depths, in his heights, in his nearness, in his farness, in his pasture, in his seas, in his fields, in his sky, in his rest, in his songs, in his families, in his courts, in his throne, in his fire, in his light. I could do this all day. I won't. In every single circumstance in your life, God is over it. Let me tell you what that means. One time I took my daughter into the backyard and we brought a watering can and an acorn and a shovel. And we go over the, we we dig out a hole and we put the acorn in there and then we water it. And then we were happy together. Do you know why? Because we know what God does with dirt and holes and water. And now I'm not talking about an acorn, I'm talking about you. And now I'm not just talking about a water pitcher, I'm talking about your baptism. And now I'm not just talking about this hole, I'm talking about your burial. No matter what, no matter what in your life, you're going to transcend it. Because you are God's, and God is yours, and God is over everything. 
and he is still in heaven. Everybody rejoices. Everybody does. Do you know what you get to do? You get to do that always. Second thing. Prayer. Everybody prays. I know some of you are saying, not everybody prays, Pastor. Atheists don't pray. The irreligious don't pray. Yes, they do. The statistics show that to you. They do. Atheists pray. They do. It's, it's this, there's a saying for a reason. There are no atheists in foxholes. Even atheists pray. I remember back in, in 2020, I went on Google Trends. You can track this kind of stuff. Did you know that ev- back in 2020, every 80,000 cases of COVID the searches for the word prayer were doubling. Everybody prays, especially in crisis. Everybody prays. What they don't do is pray continually. That's different. That's Pentecost. Praying all the time. We do, we do get to do that. We get to do that. We get to pray continually. Isn't that amazing? We get to pray continually. <laughs> Most people, they don't realize it, but prayer in their life is an exercise in talking to themselves. And I'm being direct right now, even as I'm being true. Most people, they think they're praying to God. They're actually just talking to themselves. You know why? You know, just to, just to look at the other side of the coin, Jesus, Jesus said, when you, when you pray in, in Jesus, when you, when you pray in my name, God always hears you. The flip side of that is when you don't. You're not going to be heard. That's when, see, that's when it turns into extra, an exercise and you're talk, talking to yourself. When, you don't, when you're not coming with Jesus in your heart, when you're not coming with faith in your heart, you, it's an exercise in talking to yourself. It's, here's what you're doing. You are, you are shooting an arrow at God. You're trying to put it into his heart to make, to make him care about what's going on in your life. And what happens is he hits bronze. Thunk. Comes right back down to earth. Okay, maybe we're not, if we're not in the bow and arrow age, we're in the cell phone age. You know what it's like is you get out your phone, you're calling God. You just get out the contact, God. You, you dial it up and all of a sudden it goes, no service. <laughs> it's, you, you, can, you cannot pray to God without Jesus. You're not getting in, but we get in. See, we get in. We get in. We get to go in there all the time. All the time. You know, I, so I was thinking about this. I was watching this TV show with Muslims in it, and, and Muslims, Muslims, you, you know there's certain times of day that you're not allowed to pray. Did you, did you know that? Did you know that there's, there's certain purification rites that you're supposed to do before you pray? It's different, it's different. See, Christians, we pray always, we pray everywhere. Do you, you know what, do you know what, it's striking to me. Do you know what moms, that was, I saw a poll once, do you know where moms find is the best time, time and place to pray in their lives? Do you know when? In the bathroom. I mean, this is a Christ, that's a totally Christian thing that I think we actually think it's an appropriate time and way to pray in the bathroom. That's how, much, that's how much we deeply believe that we can come to God wherever we are, however we are, no matter where. We, we might be on top of a mountain. We might be in a prison cell. We might have just sinned. We maybe can't remember exactly the last sin we committed. It doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter when we are. It doesn't matter how put together we are in the moment. We can always pray coming to God through Jesus. It's an invitation to pray all the time. Isn't that amazing? I do want to clarify this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm treating this like an invitation to you. Sometimes people take this, these two words, pray, pray continually, and they take it and they, they turn it into an incredible burden. It bothers me. I read, I read a commentary where they, 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 ta- they took adverbs and they made this, they made it seem like every time you pray, there should be like beads of sweat popping out of your brow. They, they added words like extended or strenuously. It doesn't say that anywhere here. 
It says we're praying all the time, continually. And it's like people get it in their head. They get it in their head that if I'm going to pray, I got to pray. I got to pray for like 30 minutes. I got to pray for like an hour. I got to have the right words. I got to have the right tenacity. I got I to gotta have the right time. I, it's, and they forget. They forget. We forget. Sometimes I think we forget that one of Jesus' primal teachings on prayer was this. We don't pray like the pagans. We do not, he said, we don't babble like them. We don't, we don't pray like these people think. We gotta, we gotta say enough words. We gotta have the right articulateness. We gotta have the right approach. Jesus said we don't pray like that. Instead, we pray through him. In fact, you know know what I think the invitation is here? I think the invitation is to pray in all kinds of different ways. Like, I do think it's appropriate sometimes to pray longer. Sometimes, sometimes you're in a Garden of Gethsemane moment in your life. And the beads of sweat are popping out. There's something, something heavy on your heart. Something's going on in your life. Take time then. Take all the time you need to unload all of it on God. All of it. Take time then. It's a time of transition, a time of happiness. Sometimes, maybe, sometimes what we want to do, we want to do it like Daniel. We want to have certain times of day when we stop and we pray. And we don't have to make it complicated. You know what we can do? We can just pray the Lord's Prayer. You know it's all in there, don't you? Any, anything you'd ever want to pray about, it's all in there. Just pray that. Jesus told you to. It's all in there. All right. You know what I recommend? You know what I recommend? I recommend dart prayers, arrow prayers. That's what I recommend a lot of times in life. Arrow prayers, seven to nine words. You can make them longer if you want. You can make them shorter if you want. If you want. Dart prayers. You got something going on in life, you send it up to God. Some people say that's dismissive. That's a dismissive of God. You, spend, you should spend more time like that. I say it's not dismissive. Do you know what it actually is? It's honoring God. That's what it is. It's you believing that it's not the amount of your words that matters, but rather that you are sending it to God and you are believing in your heart that he is going to hear you, that just maybe seven or nine words, you send it in the heart of God, you land it there, he's going to listen, he's going to act, you dart it up there, and it's just like that. Anywhere, anytime, always, you can pray. There's a young man named Joseph Scrivener. Back in 1844, as the story goes, he was about to get married the next day, of all things. And his his fiancée lived in Ireland, and they decided they were going to get together the day before they were getting married. And so they both jumped on their horses, and they they were going to have this picnic on the River Bond. So they both get on their horses and they go, and she gets there just before he does. And the horse, her horse, bucks her off and throws her into the river. She drowns. He gets there just in time to see the bystanders pulling her body out of the water, and he sees her face. They were going to get married the next day. He reflected on that, and he wrote these poetic words. He said, when he saw her, the bottom of my world seemed to just disappear. See, the bottom came off. The bottom of his world seemed to disappear, he said. It was that man who had that experience, who went home and he wrote these words. What a friend we have in Jesus. 
all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Everything, 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 everything. All the time. God will carry you. Just like he carried Joseph Scribner. To pray is natural, it's human. To pray all the time and have the confidence to do so. That is the life of the Spirit. And now we got one final one here from Paul. He says this. He says, give thanks in all circumstances. By, okay, by now you're on to me. You, you know that I do this comparison, contrast thing. It's nor, normal, right? Natural to give thanks. Natural. We even have a national holiday for this, to give thanks. And people will tell you, so, social psychologists will tell you what you should do is you should have a gratitude journal. This is not, this is very normal. It's very human. Here's what's supernatural. The life of the Spirit in you, that you give thanks in all circumstances. In all circumstances. Now, let me nuance that. You notice what Paul didn't say. He didn't say, give thanks for all circumstances. <laughs> That's very different. You can give thanks in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. There, there, there are some circumstances that it would be very wrong of us to give thanks for. That would, that's what we call spiritual masochism. We don't, we don't, oh yay, I get to suffer now. That's not it. We don't give thanks for all things. There's some things that we should grieve. There's some things that we should lament. There's some things that we should repent of. It's not give thanks for all circumstances. It's give thanks in all circumstances. And now it's, look, now I want to say something different than I said before. Before, before I said we're going to transcend all our circumstances. I was talking about the future. I was talking about our hope. Here I want to say something different. Now I want to, because I, I, I think Paul is saying something different. Here God is telling us to give thanks in what God is doing in the present. Not in the future, but in the present. And I want to go it like this proving this to you. Every time God calls us, calls us for something, calls, gives us something, he's doing it because there's a certain foundation for it. So when God calls for the forgiveness of our sins, it's because Jesus died for us. When God calls for us to be raised from the dead, it's because Jesus has destroyed the power of death. When God says, when he God, God calls for us to pray, it's because God is absolutely going to listen to us because of the blood of Jesus on us. And when God calls us to give thanks in all circumstances, it's because he's in them. And now I'm quoting, now I want to quote Paul in a different part of, of, of the Bible where he says, God is, he got, God is working out all things for our good. All of them, God is in the circumstance. He's molding them. He's, he's channeling them. He's, he's changing them. He's, he's, he's bringing them to where he wants to, to you to get to so something good in your life. This is what God does. It's what he did for Joseph. Trumped up sexual assault charges. He ends up in jail. And God uses it to make him the second in command of all of the superpower of that time, Egypt. Esther, there was, there was going to be a genocide. There was going to be a genocide of all of God's people and all the Esther. Esther, God uses it, that trouble, and changes it to, to, make, to make her in, into this hero, this heroine. Jesus, Jesus is crucified. What does God bring out of it? God brings out of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ salvation for the, for the entire world. God takes our circumstances. He, he changes them into something good. Yeah, I, we don't always see this in life. We don't always see it in life. Sometimes we do. I was reminded of that 
the way that sometimes God encourages us and lets us see it. Uh, my big sister, I got to see her this weekend. She has Down syndrome, and she's kind of had a rough patch over the past couple years. She fell, and she wrecked her knee, just totally wrecked it, so she had a surgery. Long story short, the surgery ended up failing. The knee wrecked again, so then she goes into surgery again, totally reconstructed the knee. She's got this massive scar on it. This happened just in January, and she just can't seem to get that knee better, and they were hoping and praying. They went to all these special doctors. Maybe, maybe she's going to be able to keep walking. Maybe this knee is going to get put back together. Maybe, maybe, maybe. She has a surgery. It seems to be going well, and then about a week ago, she steps out the front door, and she had been healing so well. And all of a sudden, my dad hears this, this scream of pain. And she'd gone down on the steps. And her knee is cocked back all weird. And my dad grabs her up, and he puts her knee just like this. And they pray. And they're like, well, they're, they're going to go see the physical therapist later in the week, and they're wondering what happened to her knee, and they're baby in the knee, and they're wondering, is she going to lose the ability to walk? What's going to happen now? And we're praying about it. We're all praying as a family. And you know what happened? This doesn't always happen. <laughs> but sometimes God lets it happen. That her knee was straightened out just enough that what actually happened to my sister's knee is that it ripped the adhesions just so, so that her knee is actually now working the way it's supposed to. It was painful, but it worked. <laughs> God can take the worst things and make them good. Give thanks and all. It doesn't always work out like that. Give th it will in the end, though. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the life we get to have. Isn't it amazing? I got to close. I want to close like this. Here's, here's my big concern today. Sometimes people hear sermons like this and they go home and they say, this is what they do. I know it. I know one. It takes one to no one. And they go, we go home like this. I should pray more. Yeah, we should. <laughs> I should rejoice more. Yeah, we should. And we take this whole thing, we take this whole thing and we turn it around and instead of this being the most encouraging thing in the world, we take it and we turn around and we make it the biggest guilt trip in the world. Don't you see what Paul is saying here? He's, he says, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. See, don't you, don't you hear what he's saying? He's, he's not trying to lay on you the biggest guilt trip in the world. He's saying, this is the kind of life that the Holy Spirit wants you to have. He wants you to have more and more and more, a life where you're always rejoicing, a life more and more and more, where you have the confidence and the joy that you always get to pray, a life more and more and more, where you always get to look at every circumstance and be grateful for what God is doing in it for you. More and more and more, and you get to have that because of Christ Jesus who is God's prayer and Christ Jesus who is God's joy and Christ Jesus who is, who is our thanksgiving to God his life, his life, his resurrection all of it for you a life of life, lightness and joy and prayer in the spirit it's Pentecost Celebrate as much as you have today and more and more and more let the Spirit move, it, move you into it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's Pentecost and it's Pentecost because of you. 
You have sent the Spirit to us. You give us the Spirit through your Word. And today you've given us the Spirit through this Word. Let us walk in step with Him today and always in our lives as we live lives with a posture of rejoicing and gratitude and prayer. The exact opposite of worry and rumination and being upset. Grant us this life by the power of your Holy Spirit and the gospel in our hearts. Amen. Please stand. Let's confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things in and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, was crucified death, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, the offering plates will come around. You do have the worship registers at the end of the pew. Um, you can take that um, and sign it and pass it on down. And if you'd like a once-a-week email from St. Mark, you can uh, give us your email address.
Please stand for prayer. We're moving into prayer and the Lord's Supper. It's a really, really exciting Sunday. Uh, Pentecost, you get to celebrate Lord's Supper. We do have several people um, who have been instructed. Um, they're ready to come into uh, public uh, expression of, of membership here at St. Mark and will be communing with us here for the first time this morning. So it's a really exciting uh, morning for us here at St. Mark. Let's join together in prayer. Blessed and gracious Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, you proceed from the Father and the Son, and together with the Father and the Son, we worship and glorify you. On this holy day, so soon after our Lord ascended to his throne in glory, you descended among his joyous followers with your holy wind and igniting fire. You open their eyes to see the clarity and completeness of the good news, just as Jesus promised you would. You ratified their ministry in the sight of the nations and conferred on them gifts and courage to be witnesses to the ends of the earth, as Jesus called them to be. Pour out your power on us again, dear Spirit, and ignite our minds and hearts to find our purpose in proclaiming the message of Christ. When success seems scarce, Console us with the gentle, quiet whisper of your word. When some will listen, open our lips to speak the truth in love. When enemies attack, defend us not with the edge of a sword, but with the power of the gospel. While we pray for ourselves, we pray for your whole church, and especially for those who go in our stead to many places around the world. Guide us deeper every day into the mysteries of Christ and enlarge our grasp of his will and ways. Provide insights to those who teach your word to others, that they may expound your truth carefully and precisely. Bless our schools as they prepare men and women to preach, teach, and model your love. Breathe in the hearts of those enduring serious afflictions, stubborn pain, and wrenching doubt, and renew them with your power. Instill your comfort in those who grieve and mourn, According to your design, grant us another Pentecostal harvest that multitudes from every nation, tribe, people, and language may join the assembly of the church to worship you and give you glory. Come, Holy Spirit, renew the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Amen. And we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. By the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he empowered his church to be witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
Please stand. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll close with a final Pentecost hymn. Real quick announcements today. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to let you know, and went out an email this week, we do have a fully staffed school at Risen Savior. Very, very thankful for that. You can see how God provided a teacher for us. Uh, Mr. Michael Vlieger is going to be the principal this coming school year, and, and so we're very thankful for that. And you can see those acceptance letters um, in the email this week. Um, one other big thing coming up this summer um, is we have something called St. Mark in the Park, and then we have uh, VBS um, coming up as well, and those dates are there for you to see um, in the in the in the announcements that come out. You want those announcements? Um, you can talk to me, and I'll help you get on those announcements. It's an email that comes out every week. But especially, we want to let you know that St. Mark in the Park, our first St. Mark in the Park event, is coming up here in early June. And these are activities that are meant to help get our name in the community, um, to connect with people there. And we're looking for general help for that evening. Um, we'll train you, we'll get you all ready. And uh, I think it's going to make an impact um, for the gospel. And, and you can talk to uh, Molly Ambrose. She's right there in the back about that. She's got her hand up in the air. Um, she'll help you get connected with that if you have um, any questions or interest in that. And with that, um, enjoy each other. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Um, hang out as long as you want here after church and um, catch up with each other. God be with you all.